Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game preview for the game Fortune and Famine by Mid-Level Meeple. The game plays two to six players, takes approximately 15 minutes per player, and is for ages 13 and up. And in the game Fortune and Famine, you are going to be a king of an outlying territory who has heard a prophecy been foretold that over the coming years, there's going to be famine and grain shortages will run out. And because of this, you've decided to gather your best workers and attempt to collect as much grain as possible, and to do so, you'll need to pay them. However, other territories are also attempting to gather grain and trying to do it faster than you can, and you want to be the best ruler, so you're going to try and gather more than they will. You utilize workers and traders, as well as powerful wizards, to store grain and mess with the competition along the way, so by the time the end of the third year happens, you have the more, most grain stored in your storage containers. If you can do so, you'll win and become the most prominent king of the land. Let's go take a look down below, I'll show you what the game comes with and how it's played, then we'll come up and I'll give you the basic synopsis for how to play the game, what, what it's like playing the game and what you can do and what audience I think this is for. Welcome to the game and I've currently set it up for two players but it can play up to six and in order to set the game up everybody is going to receive a player board as well as a player token of their color and how you determine color is simple by taking all of the queens in the game shuffling them and then dealing them out randomly. Some queens have a passive ability built into them that will affect gameplay and the other queens will actually have unique abilities that can be used during a certain portion of gameplay but only a certain number of times. You're also going to go ahead and distribute out one color common farmer to each player. These are actually front and back, so you can't miss them. Then go ahead and give every single player one grain token and three silver tokens that will basically be their starting supply for the game because they're going to try and acquire more as the game continues. You're also then going to take each of these decks here. These are the year decks, one, two, and three. And based on the number of players, you'll take those cards. And for the number of two players, you're going to take the cards that have a two on the bottom. If you were playing three players, you take the cards with two and three four players, four, three, and two, so on and so forth, so that you add more cards based on the number of players. You'll set aside any extra queens that you're not utilizing and any extra tokens that you're not utilizing as well as the common farmers. Uh, this card here is going to represent the first player of the round, so you're going to simply set it up on this little pedestal and place it next to the starting uh, kingdom and the starting king. All the rest of the cards you will not be utilizing either. And then you're going to simply begin gameplay. And in gameplay, you're going to be playing down a round and you'll be taking these specific actions as you go through. Uh, the first step is a simultaneous step. It's called the hiring phase in which you're going to take cards from here. You'll discard one card and you'll take cards based on the number of players and place them onto the board. After you do that, then you're going to check to see if anything interesting happens. Like, for instance, this card is a famine card, which means that all players immediately lose half their grain rounded up, which is, is not so great. Uh, these cards, that are, the grain that's in here is going to go away. Um, and then you're going to go ahead and check to see if there's anything else that needs to be looked at. In this case here, we have a common farmer. So, during the higher phase, you're now going to go ahead and begin to bid, starting with the player who has the marker here. And you can bid one, two, or three on any of the workers that are present. Like I was saying before, if it was a three-player game, you would add three of these cards, and a four-player game, you would add four of them. Uh, in this case here, this player might actually want a common farmer, and maybe he or she will go ahead and take one coin and place it on as a bid, along with their bidding marker to note that this is their bid. It'll go past clockwise and players can then choose to outbid any players that have bids on this board here. So in this case, if purple really, really wants this farmer, they can go ahead and place their token there as well as two bid coins. And thusly, this bid will go back to the green player and the green player, in this case, is going to actually have an opportunity to buy or to outbid this. And you always have to bid at least one more, and a bid must always be at least one. If he or she does not want to bid, then they can pass. And with this famine card, it's going to remain in play up until the end of the round, so there's nothing else for this player to gain. In which case, this player here is going to then spend the currency they used to buy the common farmer, place it there on their board, place the bidding marker on the side there, and then you'll move on to the next phase, which is attack. Attacking doesn't happen in round, in, 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 until years two and three. So until this deck depletes and these cards start coming out, you're going to ignore attacking. But in general, attacking is going to work based on the cards that are in play. There are some cards that have an attack symbol. You won't miss them. They'll look like this. And you'll be able to utilize them during this phase before the payment phase. Then 
the payment phase. Pay every one of your workers, and if you'll note, every single worker you have that's going to be up here is going to have a uh, cost associated with a gain. And in this case, this is going to cost one silver for two grain, and this one over here is going to cost one silver for two grain. Uh, he doesn't have any more uh, silver to pay, so unfortunately they cannot go ahead and place another one here. So what's going to happen is after all payment has been done, you're going to move on to the reward phase. Reward phase is, is fairly simple. You will go ahead and subtract any currency that you paid from your workers, and then you're going to go ahead and gain any benefits associated. So in this case, they both gain two grain, placing it there. The final thing that happens in the round is a decision. You can have one or the other. The first one is you can collect one resource of any type, whether it be a silver or whether it be a grain. And in this case, this player wants a silver because he or she is going to need to start gathering more of the workers. Uh, the other player, however, is going to probably want to store grain. And how storing grain works is pretty simple. You'll take one silver, discard it, and then you will take any silver that you, or any grain that you would like in your storage and you'll put it inside of your bag. I don't have a bag right now, but I'll go ahead and set it aside right now just to show you that this is where it's going to be kept safe. So whenever a famine card comes out, cannot mess with these here. And in most cases, most cards can't mess with these. This is your protected area. This is how many points you score at the end of the game and whoever has the most is the winner. After you've made your decision, you'll move back to the hiring phase, in which case you'll discard one of the cards here. You'll flip out one, cards now equal the number of players and then they're going to go ahead and move on to doing the bidding, in which case this is also going to move because at the end of every round, you're going to move this first player marker, indicating that a new player is going to be the one in charge of starting the bidding. Now this player might go ahead and bid on one of these guys or not. Now, another thing to note too is there are certain cards like this one here. This is a wizard and wizards do not have a cost associated with them when it comes to bidding. It's just the first player that wants to take it can take it and put it into their board. Uh, you can only ever take one card during the bidding phase, so if this player takes this one, then this player can spend a coin to gain a common Jester. Uh, jesters are actually rather nice because during the reward phase, they can either take a grain or they can take a silver. So it's guaranteed income as you continue going throughout the game. Whereas in this case, this player here, in place of your decision, you can take one grain or one silver and then you can store for free, which is a rather useful card. If you want to, you can go ahead and you'll, you'll play this card and you'll, you'll discard it. All wizards get discarded after you utilize them, unless any card says otherwise, but I don't think they do. And that's how the game goes. It'll keep going on. You'll keep gathering more currency. You'll keep trading with these guys or paying these guys and gathering some type of reward, trying to store grain into your bags and attempting to have the most by the end of the year. Uh, as you'll note, the cards start getting more advanced as the game goes on with more unique and interesting abilities like this uh, unique skilled jester. You can gain one grain and a silver and so on and so forth, stronger wizards uh, and of course traders that let you trade one for one. Another thing to note too is you can never have more than two of the same uh, card and if you do, you can never be too skilled. So in this case, you can have two common farmers, but you can't have two skilled farmers. You could have a jester, a farmer, a trader, and a wizard. That's not a problem as well, but just note that two of rule. And the last thing is your abilities. This one here says that instead of taking a wizard or bidding on a worker, you can take one resource of your choice. So instead of just passing on your turn, if you cannot afford to do anything or take anything, this character will let you actually gather a resource, which is rather nice. And then you have this one here, Queen Elteza. Ezra, uh, you'll start with three tokens on here, and if you spend one uh, to place, a, you can spend one to place a bid. Uh, you immediately take the worker, regardless of any opposing bids. So it's a rather strong card in the fact that you can take what you want for a lower cost. However, you only get three of them throughout the entire game, and once you've utilized these, your worker doesn't have your your queen doesn't have any more power. And that's it. That's how you play the game Fortune and Famine. Uh, we'll come up and discuss any little intricacies, intricacies and stuff, and then we'll discuss who uh, this game is for and what other and unique things we can do in this game. Fortune and Famine is a light bidding game in which you're going to be bidding on one thing during your turn and attempting to acquire it as you go throughout the years. Uh, you'll be utilizing these workers and attempting to get them onto your board, which then you can pay to produce for you. And producing is important because you need to gather grain as much as possible. But you have to be careful too, because if you gather too much grain and a famine card comes out, you'll lose half of your grain rounded up. So if you do not have it stored, it's a potential loss for you. Now there are certain abilities 
abilities in certain queens that can prevent this or protect you, but most of the time it's not for every single one, and so you kind of have to decide how much you want to push your luck, how much you want to save and utilize as payment, because some workers require grain as payment, and how much you want to store spending precious silver that you need in order to purchase more workers. The bidding is pretty straightforward. The first player who is the leader is going to bid on something or gather a wizard. The next player is then going to go ahead and choose to outbid you or take any remaining wizard or bid on another card. With more players comes more options for bidding and more choices that allow you to kind of customize your tab below. When you're playing this game, note that yes, in a two player game, you're only going to have two cards that are going to come out and one player might actually not end up getting anything because a famine might come out or they might not have enough silver to bid on something or if they have no silver and somebody takes uh, something, they might be kind of out of luck there. Uh, another thing to note too is if you're playing with a large number of players, uh, there might be a large diverse amount of group uh, of choices. However, as people start bidding too high or things start getting a little more hectic, it gets a little more challenging to gather what you want and having to make choices. So it all comes down to a lot of choices. Do you want to save this? Do you want to use this now? If you use it now, it's going to cost you next round. If you don't use it now, you might be ahead next round. So sometimes even if you see something that you would like, it might be best to wait for next round for new cards to come out. And of course, as the years progress from the year one to two to three, the cards get better, more usable, more powerful. They're going to allow you to gather more currency at a higher rate. Uh, typically the first year, it's like one to one to one or one to two, depending on what you're gathering or, or gaining in some ways. Like for instance, the jester is going to give you one of your choice or the workers will give you a uh, one silver for two grain and wizards are pretty uh, weaker and not not weak but they're less powerful than the year two and three um, and you only have four slots too you have to make sure that you keep what you want and sometimes you might want a specific worker but you have a great tableau already as it is uh, however if you do not take that worker it might cost you later because that player might get ahead of you by having a stronger more skilled worker than what you currently already have and you might have to make a choice to sacrifice something in order to gain that card to prevent somebody from getting something else. Uh, so you make sure your choices are, are limited and it's on purpose. It's meant to cause you a little bit of stress as to like, do you really want this? Are you going to limit somebody else uh, at, at a cost to your own potential detriment? The queens are all very powerful. All of the queens feel game breaking, but that's a good thing, right? Every single one of them is balanced in that way to where you're like, wow, this is a really, really good ability. Do you want to gather cards for free? Or would you prefer to, when the famine card comes out, ignore the famine, discard a token, and place your grain that you would have lost inside of your pool? Really, really good. So note that you need to make sure that you utilize them when it's very, very important to do so. Uh, you're also going to notice that the wizards can be very powerful. There's certain wizards that will attack. They can even attack certain grain inside of somebody's storage. They might be allowing you to gain certain currency. There's an abundance of different types of wizards that will let you do certain things. Traders will come into play. Maybe you have a lot of grain, but not enough silver to bid on the next round. So on this round, you can spend uh, one or the other to switch. And the more powerful traders will allow you to gather more of a certain currency. You can spend two for two or three for three with some powerful traders, whereas the small Smaller ones will let you do one for one. And that's pretty much the idea of the game. Getting through to the end without losing too much from the famine cards that come out, the pushing your luck factor of keeping the grain in your storage without having to spend too much silver, because the more you store up, the less silver you have to use when dumping it into your storage. However, those cards may or may not come out too, which is another interesting thing in the game as well, is when you're playing the cards from the years, you always have to discard one. So you may end up not getting any famines at all. Maybe in fact that year you happen to discard every single one and so you've also been spending silver every round to make sure that you get that weed inside your storage however unfortunately for you no famine came out and i decided to spend one silver at the end and dump all of it in and now i have a lot more silver to spend for the next year and that's basically the idea of the game that's how you play the game it's got these player boards i, I think this is a, a prototype it's going to be on kickstarter i'll have a link down below in the description where you can go ahead and take a look at the game there's a large variety of customizable cards and choices for your tableau and different queens that you can utilize and it's very simple very straightforward and easy to understand and easy to play this game took me relatively about a half an hour to play in a two-player setting and took me about 45 minutes to play in a three-player setting. So that 15 time limit for each player is, is pretty much on the mark. It probably even takes a little less time with equal to when more players come out. If you're interested in picking up the game Fortune and Famine, there's a link down below. Go ahead and click that link. All right, guys, thanks for watching and 
outro time. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button and that bell notification button to go ahead and see more of our previews and reviews on the channel for upcoming Kickstarter campaigns, just like Fortune and Famine over here. You can also go ahead and head over to our website, unfilteredgamer.com. We have a bunch of blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter lists, and more. Speaking of new content, our my wife's game, Moonshell Mermaid Game, is coming out tomorrow, March 2nd, or in the past, if you're watching this in, in, in the future, which is when this campaign's going to go on. I'll have a link below, like I said before, where you can check out the campaign and all of their social media as well. Uh, Moonshell is a strategic uh, tile grabbing game in which you're trying to gather shells and put them onto rock spaces from the ocean and then onto your own treasure chest. They're trying to collect stunning patterns for open and closed objectives while utilizing mermaids and mermeeples with powers, like, similar to games that are match three as well as games like Sagrada and Tiny Towns as far as puzzles go. You can also go ahead and check out our live streams every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. PST where we play games just like this one down below each and every week. We give away games there when we can. We do uh, unique and interesting things on Discord as well with links there uh, for painting contests and auctions and, and so on and so forth. And if you're interested, go ahead and join up on Patreon. Thank you so much, Patreon members. We greatly, greatly appreciate you guys supporting us. It helps us be able to send out shipping content for you guys, uh, such as the Moonshell swag we sent out about a month ago. If you got that, I hope you guys do, do take some pictures or show some stuff off online during the campaign. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. And as always, I look forward to not dealing with any famine with you next time. <laughs>